Good morning. Welcome to the Bodybuilding.com podcast. I'm Nick Polius, an editor for Bodybuilding.com, and we're all melted to the scorching pavement in Boise, Idaho. Sluggish and low energy feels kind of like we're getting older. And that's because we are, all of us actually, you too. And that's kind of the theme of today's discussion. Um, If there are two things, two messages, I guess, that I feel like I tried to hammer home through the articles I help publish with Bodybuilding.com, It's that you have more control over your body and its abilities than you think. And your body has more control over your life than you think. And strength training is one of the best ways to improve both quality of life and life expectancy as you get older. This is showing up in the research more and more. And, uh, you know, those two things together mean not just being around longer, but actually feeling better. But at the same time, as the years go by, responsibilities pile up. It's really easy to think, this is who I am, this is my life, these are my capabilities. I've been guilty of that, and each year that goes by, it gets more tempting to slip into that fixed mindset. But working here and collaborating regularly with smart coaches like our guest today have really opened my eyes, and I wanted to share some of that perspective with you, no matter what age you are. Our guest, uh, Charles Staley, is one of the great strength minds of the last few decades. He's written a ton for us and everybody else. He's coached a wide range of athletes and once upon a time was also the progenitor of the escalating density training protocol, which we'll discuss in this call. Um, I, I grabbed him over Skype from his home in Arizona, so let's listen in. Welcome to the Bodybuilding.com podcast, Charles Staley. Really happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. And this con- this conversation ostensibly relates to a new column you're starting for us called Ask the Ageless Lifter. And we'll l- probably have you back on in the future to talk more about that. But it really kind of starts a bit earlier with a very popular article you did for us called How I Got Into My Best Shape Ever at Age 55. And that headline, you know, to anybody who's been on our site, that sort of headline is not going to seem strange to them. We do a lot of sort of transformation, life-changing pieces. So that headline yeah. is no shocker, but it's not usually by one of our strength coach offers, or authors. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it was a great read. I, I, rec- I recommend it and we'll link to it. But basically, you were an elite strength coach and trainer for many years, but you didn't feel like you were living up to your end of your, your strength potential or kind of looking the part. And then it changed one day and you started to take a more serious look at things like body composition, being in shape, and not just being yeah. strong. So my first question would be, you know, what, what took us, what, what took you so long and what really opened your eyes at that age? Well, you know how when you don't see yourself the way that you actually look, the sure. term is escaping me at the moment. Uh, but, but I had kind of the reverse of that. I would look at myself in the mirror and think, oh, I look good, you know. But, and, then, and then one time I got this photo of myself, like, nah, I don't really look very good here. Like, I just, and, and there's the classic thing where women look in the mirror and they, they look much better than they think they look and men are the opposite. So <laughs> I'm looking so good. I kind of didn't yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't really follow that. And, and also, um, you know, I got to admit through most of my twenties and thirties, I thought it was kind of narcissistic to train for appearance. Sure. Um, I just thought it was beneath me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then of course, once I got lean in my fifties, like my whole tune changed because uh, you know, and especially professionally as a coach, it, it, it definitely makes sense to sort of uh, exude the the appearance that that, that your clients want. So it just uh, it just took me a while, and uh, you know, I th- and this also goes back to kind of a, a common theme of mine, which is that people tend to focus a lot on methods mm-hmm. uh, and not really the application to the method. And if you look at successful people, and, and this means people who got strong or really lean or really muscular, um, the methods really vary. Um, so that's not really the, the linchpin. The linchpin is your ability and willingness to work consistently you know, hard mm-hmm. toward whatever method that is. And, and that's kind of what I was lacking. Hmm. So um, no, knowledge is not enough, you know, as the saying goes. So, you, yeah, you, you were a strength guy, you say in the article, really never more than five reps. And I kind of understand that. That mentality, as because when people start working at a company like Bodybuilding.com, sometimes they feel like, "Oh, great, this is my chance. I'm going to change my body. I'm going to look like a bodybuilder." And then other people sort of back off and say, "Oh, that that's a narcissistic approach. I, you know, I, I don't I, that doesn't feel right for me." And I, I sort of fell into that latter camp for a long time as well. And uh, yeah, if I'm going to get strong. I'm not going to get muscular. Um, but then all of a sudden, you did start to prioritize things like fat loss and muscle gain in your training. H- how soon do you feel like it started to pay off? Uh, pretty quick, a couple of months. Um, I walked around in most of my 30s and 40s. I walked around at about 225, mm-hmm. which is, is not like terribly big, but I'm, I'm drug free. And uh, 
you know, just for just for reference, when I was 18, I weighed 135 at six foot two. Wow. So um, so, you know, basically, you know, I'm 90 pounds heavier. And today I walk around at about 195. Um, so it's not like I'm particularly that big. But right. one of the things, you know, as I look down the road, I'm, I'm 58 now, as I look down the road to being like maybe 70 or whatever, um, I'm already strong enough. Like, like you know, I'm I'm deadlifting over 500 and squatting about 400. I mean, how strong do you need to be to, uh, you know? So, but the funny thing is, is that being lean, uh, even if you got there from narcissism, <laughs> but being lean it really has really way more payoff toward health indicators and and just functionality and orthopedic status. And all of that. So, you know, it helps everything but powerlifting. So, mm. so losing body weight, like, is not really great for your max squat or deadlift or bench. But for, for literally everything else, it really pays off. So, hmm. um, yeah, I just started kind of changing my emphasis. And, mm-hmm. um, well, lean, lean and muscular uh, is even better, though, right? Yeah, 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 particularly. And, and what's nice, it's, and, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about what it's like to train as an older person, but, it, um, you know, there's a difference between being a newbie when you're in your 50s and having a long training background. And if you do have a training uh, a background, what's nice is those adaptations kind of stabilize. So you don't really have to uh, do that much work to maintain the muscle that you've already had mm-hmm. if you've been training for 20, 30 years. And do you, do you find when you work with, with aging lifters, though, that their bodies are sort of starved for this muscular um, stimulus? Because I, I, I hear that from articles and coaches saying, you know, that, uh, even people 80 and 90 years old, it's amazing how quickly their bodies respond because they've just been kind of under muscled yeah. for so long. Yeah. If you're a beginner, um, mm-hmm. I just started with a, a guy last week who's in his uh, late fifties. And, uh, you know, when you don't have a training background, you're, you're, you, you have beginner's gains, you know, mm-hmm. at any like, age, at, yeah. every, every sing, yeah, at any age, every single workout, you're, you're getting new PRs in the gym and, uh, the trans, you know, the, the changes are really, uh, really stark. You know, you can really, uh, really see them. So yeah, it's kind of nice. It makes mm-hmm. it fun. Now I was reading one of Dan John's books recently and he presented this little age model of how he classifies athletes, which I think is sort of predicated on the, the fit ranks model. And the groups were something like 16 to 35, 36 to 55 and 56 and over. And this was kind of an eye opener for me at age 37 to think I'm in the same group as a 55 year old man or woman, <laughs> yeah. and that, that I should prioritize my my aging body and my training. Uh, but but when, when do you think someone starts to need to take should really start to take their age into consideration and that um, and, and that timeline moving forward in in, in their training and in yeah. their self care? Well, right. I'd love to give you a number. I you know I have clients all over the world, and um, the vast majority of them are over 50. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I tell them uh, repeatedly is that, you know, you need to respect your age, but you shouldn't allow it to define you. And the reason I say that is because, yes, age is a factor that, that, that uh, uh, Im- you know, uh, has impact on how you train and how you recover. But it's not the only factor, and it's not necessarily even the biggest factor. So there's a big difference between two 65-year-old guys where one, you know, has good orthopedic status, he's got good nutrition, good hormonal uh, levels, um, he sleeps well, you know, you don't have a lot of stress in your life versus the opposite of that. So, uh, you know, you got to respect it. You have to take it into account as one of the factors that you kind of uh, look at when you're putting your training together and your recovery from training. But people get a little, it's, it's kind of like when you get older, people just sort of think like their age is the only factor right. that, that defines them. And it's really not. It's just one factor of many. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and especially if you've kind of lived the same way for you know years or decades, you think this is just, this is just who I am and these are my capabilities. This is how I feel. You know, I have this pain here. It's just a pain I learned to live with. Um, yeah. Do you, do do uh, do people over fifty? Do you find that their their minds can still be blown by by what they're capable of? Oh, uh, trust me. There's there's no question. I've got I've got a a, a client in Belize who's uh, fifty, uh, actually sixty three now. He st- he had never lifted before. All of his coaching is from me online. Started lifting with me when he was sixty one, and now he's deadlifting. He's about a two hundred pound guy. He's deadlifting three fifteen per set of three. Hmm. And two years ago, he had never, he had no idea even what a deadlift was. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that is fun. And, you know, 
that's why we do what we do because it's just fun sharing this with people and sure. uh, yeah it's pretty mind blowing hmm. yeah it's and and talking talking about the deadlift in particular is interesting because i feel like that's that's a, a lift that i see videos of older people doing more than any other i feel like you know you see this you know there's an 85 year old grandma and she can deadlift her body weight plus, you know, body weight and a half or something like that. Is is the is the deadlift the uh, the, the fountain of youth? Boy, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to say that, but <laughs> maybe pretty close. I mean, you know, it, it's um on, on the one hand, if you're like a bodybuilder, you know, the deadlift is not like a key movement because it's not the best way to train any specific motion, right? Uh, uh, mu muscle, excuse me. But boy, it just accomplishes a lot, you know. So. You know, when efficiency is the goal, and that is one of the things you have to think about when you're older is just being efficient with your with your training. Mm -hmm. Boy, it really gets a lot done for, for one movement. And, uh, you know, and, and aside from what it does for your strength and muscularity, you know, just in terms of teaching you how to brace and how to lift with good mechanics uh, and just to give you functionality in your life, uh, boy, it's it's a big tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that, that that efficiency really is is an interesting and part of this because um, when when I think of somebody like I don't know, think about my father going into the gym thinking, all right, what am I going to do? Uh, he doesn't want to go over and pick up a barbell off the ground, so he instead he's going to pick his body into pieces, machine by machine by machine. And yeah. you know, I mean, there's maybe there, there's something to be said for that, uh, uh, you know, from a muscle growth perspective, perhaps, but it's definitely not the most efficient way to approach the gym. Do you feel do you feel like that's that uh, that narrative is something you have to battle against when you're working with people? Yeah, and people come to me with different narratives, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and I try not to be dogmatic. There's a place for machines too. You know, mm -hmm. there I get sometimes I, I get people who are older and they cannot maintain a safe posture to do things like squats and deadlifts, and we'll use machines for sure. But uh, on the other hand, I, I just I just started uh, a gal a couple of weeks ago who is 76, has never lifted before, and she can do a, per, per, in two weeks, she's doing a per, you know picture-perfect deadlift. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's typical, but these people are out there. So, um, yeah, I, th I think it's kind of a mix, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, these machines and free weights are tools. They have specific uh, benefits and drawbacks. Right. And so th that's why coaches always uh, debate each other about everything under the sun because, uh, you know, there is no perfect method. There's no perfect exercise. There is just a profile of uh, benefit to drawback. And that's where your personal philosophy as a coach comes in, mm -hmm. where you're trying to match that profile against the client's goals. Well, and, and the, uh, the, the, other, the other narrative that I, or the, the other thing that is easy, it seems like, for people to slip into um, who don't go to the gym all that often, especially in the Middle Ages, you know, my workout. This is my workout. I have a workout. I do my workout. But in your first article, uh, which is called "Is Going Heavy a Young Man's Game," you you describe yeah. a three block system of four weeks, around four weeks per block. That's really, you know, it, it's uh, everything changes every four weeks. You train for work capacity for four weeks, hypertrophy for four weeks, then strength for four weeks, then you rinse and repeat. It could be hard for somebody to yep. wrap their mind around that. It's like they think they're training for something all of a sudden. They're not just out there, you know, doing my workout. Uh, what, 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 do you, how do you feel yeah. like that benefits somebody to think like that and to approach it like well, that? Well, it gets you, you know, it, you know, and that's the difference between training and exercise, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, you know, I, I think if I may say so, I think I'm the originator of this concept, uh, back in the nineties, but, um, you know, the exercise is just an experience. Uh, it's, it's a one-time thing. You do it for the endorphin rush or just cause it makes you feel better afterwards. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's mm -hmm. totally fine. But, you know, when you're training, now we are talking about a process that's linked to an outcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think a lot of people kind of relate to that way of thinking, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I like people to think like they are athletes. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I've got clients who are competing in powerlifting in their 70s. Um, and that's fun. And that's something that the typical 70-year-old just does not think is even conceivable at right. all. So. Yeah, so it's just an athletic way of thinking, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we try to have you know a block of training that's geared toward a specific outcome, and and these blocks of training are all kind of linked. There's uh, you know a succession that that goes forward. So mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so work work capacity the the, fir the first block there though it's a it's a term that can be uh, really hard for people to wrap their mind around. You you hear different people give it very different um, definitions of it. 
somebody who's thinking about approaching their training that way, what, what typifies work capacity training in a four week block? Yeah. And you know, some coaches call this uh, training to train, mm -hmm. you know, or like a, a prep phase. So you're just getting yourself to the point where you can do the amount of work that's necessary to provoke an adaptation. So this is typically just higher rep stuff. And by the way, this really depends on, on what your background is and what your goals are. But right. I mean, for example, if you are a power lifter, work capacity training might be sets of 10 to 12. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of sets up a, a, a base uh, so that later on when you're doing sets of four to six, uh, you kind of slingshot because you, you know, in an adaptational kind of sense, because uh, now uh, because the volumes are so much reduced, uh, you can increase the intensity of that loading. Uh, so that's how that works. And this is just kind of traditional, sometimes called linear periodization, sometimes called block periodization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's other ways to skin the cat, but uh, I, I find that this works really well. Hmm. Okay. And, and, and during this, during a, a hypertrophy phase, um, you know, it can be someone, it can be scary for someone to sort of pass that anabolic golden age of their 20s to think about <laughs> adding muscle because they think, well, I'm going to get fat, right? Um, I, I did a little yeah. hypertrophy phase for the first time in a long time recently, just six weeks long. And I, I know it can kind of be a mental struggle. You think, all right, I'm going to add a little bit of muscle and a lot of fat, and one of them is going to stick around and the other one's not really going to stick around. Um, is is, that, a, is right. that something you have to battle against? Yeah, sometimes. And um, and some people, you know, some people too have, have the concern that sometimes is legitimate that, well, I don't know if I can gain any muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, I don't, I probably can't gain any more muscle myself. I mean, I've been training 35 years and I'm almost 60 years old. So that's why I use the term hypertrophy slash work capacity slash, uh, you know, uh, uh, anti catabolism in a sense. Mm -hmm. In other words, maybe you're not training to gain muscle, but maybe you're training to prevent the loss of muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and there's uh, probably also some fat loss that could happen in, the, in that sort of There's some fat loss that could happen for sure, and there's some cardiovascular benefits. And also, you know what? That type of training is more efficient because if you think about it, if you're training in the 10 to 12 rep range, you don't need as many warm-up sets. Mm -hmm. So your workouts are faster. And you don't need – by the way, you don't need as much rest between sets if you're doing sets of 10 to 12 as you do if you're doing sets of 4 to 6. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing just becomes faster. It's easier on your joints. And, uh, you know, also if you're a beginner, beginners tend to adapt non-specifically. So in other words, if you're advanced, you have to do low rep training to get stronger and higher rep training to grow muscle. Right. But if you're a beginner, uh, you know, you're doing 10 to 12 rep sets, uh, you're going to have strength and hypertrophy adaptations. So that's another advantage of being a beginner. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're a big believer in cycling movements throughout these blocks as well. Um, what, what movements do you feel like lend themselves best to, to that type of volume or don't lend themselves well, to that type of volume? Yeah. Well, I tend to, um, you know, this is just old school stuff, I guess, but I tend to uh, gravitate toward big, so-called big compound multi-joint movements, such as the various forms of squatting, deadlifting, pressing, and pulling, and so forth. And I like this because they're just more efficient. You're training a lot of muscles with a, a small number of exercises. And uh, you, I think those type of movements also have a greater uh, ability to kind of, um, you know, disrupt homeostasis and really kind of get your body's attention. Right. As, as, as opposed to doing like a tricep kickback or, mm -hmm. you know, bicep curl. And those things are fine. Um, I actually had a... Uh, uh, kind of a, a real storm of controversy on my uh, Facebook page recently because I said that I don't have clients do curls with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a lot of people are misinterpreting this, but the, the point of it is, is that, you know, you can do curls on your own. It's not, it's not the most technical feat in the world to flex your elbow. <laughs> right. So, you know, so I want my clients to do the more challenging work with me. And then if they're going to do like direct single joint type work, they can do it on their own. But yeah, you know, start with the meat and potatoes and, you know, Maybe start with a row and a dumbbell bench press. And if time and energy permits, sure, you can do some direct arm work, but uh, only if time permits. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I remember when you were logging your, um, your training on breaking muscle, there were curls in there. I remember seeing curls in, in your training programs. It's not, it's, not like they're, uh, yeah. it's not like you're just doing uh, nothing but squats and deadlifts all day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got you know, to um, learn to contextualize information. I mean, Everything matters, but mm -hmm. some things matter more than other things. 
And so that's important when you're trying to be efficient. Hmm. Well, and that's, that's, that's a good point to bring up thinking also of, you know, uh, the person who's coming to the gym, maybe who is in a phase in their life where they have a little bit more disposable income is maybe more likely to work with a trainer. And yeah, you can choose to either have the trainer guide you through everything or just guide you through the most important part and then trust you to do the rest of it. So if if somebody is, if somebody is going to do that, they're thinking, okay, I, I, I want to hire a trainer. What, uh, what, what should they, yeah, what sort of things should they prioritize with that, with that trainer? Is it like, teach me how to squat, teach me how to deadlift? Is that, is yeah. that the most important yeah. thing? Yeah, I think, you know, skills and habits. Mm-hmm. And, you know, skills involve understanding the technical execution of, of fundamental exercises. But skills also involve, like, how do you, how do, you do your warm-up sets? And what do you do if something hurts? And uh, how do you structure your, your, you know, your, your protein timing around, you know, workouts and mm-hmm. things like that? So those are skills and, and habits are just, uh, you know, relate a little bit more to recovery and, and you know, sleeping and, uh, and, and just getting your nutrition together and so forth. So, yeah, I think that's the best place to start. Mm-hmm. Although sometimes I have clients who come to me. I have somebody who just started with me a couple of weeks ago and she just wants to learn how to deadlift. Mm-hmm. You know, she just, you know, and of course that might morph into something else down the road and that's fine. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I think. I think understanding the biomechanics are really big uh, because you can learn how to program by watching YouTube videos and by reading people's articles, and uh, you can figure out nutrition that way too. But I think biomechanics are a big part of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I feel I was just talking about this with somebody here who's a personal trainer this morning that um, the, the deadlift is just it, it's more popular than ever right now. It's just uh, I feel like two, three, four years ago. Everybody was saying, oh, you got to squat, you got to squat. And now there's just in these tiny little waves, the deadlift is just the thing right now on social media. Everybody's constantly yeah. putting pictures of it. Um, yeah. I, and I think it's a, I think it's a good, I think it's a good movement, you mm-hmm. know? And, uh, and you know, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but the deadlift is a great assessment tool. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if you say, Hey Charles, I've got this gal who I want to send to you. She's moving to Phoenix and, uh, she can squat X, Y, Z. Uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> that right. can mean anything, you know, but if you say that somebody can deadlift X, Y, Z, or, you know, conversely, if they can do X number of chin-ups, you know, I suddenly know a lot about that person. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I think it's a good, uh, a good way to kind of compare yourself against others and, uh, and kind of, that's an interesting way to look status. at it. Yeah. 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 Are, are, yeah. are there any other markers like that, that somebody can, can, uh, say, all right, if I, if I want to know where I stand as opposed to, you know, maybe uh, I, I can do this, but it doesn't mean what I think it means. Deadlift, chin up. Is there is there anything else that stands out? Those are my two. Those are my two real go tos. Mm-hmm. And you know, the chin up is 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 really useful because um, it tells you a little bit about somebody's body composition when you think about it. Right. I mean, if you can do twenty chins, uh, you're lean. Mm-hmm. I don't. You know, you are lean. Like I don't care what you weigh, uh, and it tells me something about your training habits. Um, so. For example, if you're a woman and you can do 10 chins, I mean, even as I just say that to you, you're, you're counting on your one hand how many women you know who can do 10 chins, right. you know? And they're badasses. Just, really, yeah, that's exactly right. And they're all lean. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so, yeah. Thinking of how somebody could envision how this fits in their life, is, is three full body workouts a, a week enough or going to be done in two? Or does it have to be more than that if somebody really wants to start to make progress? Yeah, such a good question. And uh and it just so relates to the individual. So if you are if you are brand new to training, two two does the job just fine mm-hmm. because again you are benefiting from beginner's gains. And two sessions a week is two sessions a week more than you've ever done. So that will stimulate an adaptation. And then down the road, probably for most people, that's going to have to morph into three sessions. Uh, but by that time, you'll you'll have seen the benefits and you'll be kind of hooked and you'll be willing to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, all things come in good time. And, uh, you know, there's a sweet spot. Um, imagine you're experienced and, and you think about what you would have to do to make progress training one day a week. Um, you know, you'd have to do like a five hour workout. Right. And that's not terribly pleasant. And then on the other hand, if you if you envision training 10 times a week, that's just kind of annoying. Like, right. sure, all your workouts will be very brief, but it's just a pain in the ass. It's just not practical. Mm-hmm. So somewhere between those two extremes, there's a sweet spot. That tends to be between three and four days a week for most people. Okay. And 
and full body workouts you feel like for the, for the vast majority of people yeah and, and um, until and unless you get very strong because for example i mean if you are uh you know if you're benching 225 or less uh you know and squatting maybe 315 or less yeah, you can train all the muscles of your body three days a week, no problem. But mm-hmm. you get into the point where you're, you know, squatting 500 pounds, you you can't train legs three days a week. You just won't recover, regardless of your age. Mm-hmm. So then then you get more into like a push pull kind of situation. Yeah, I remember you did an interesting piece for us where you put this this sort of theory out that the uh, the weight on the bar has to has something to say about how many days it takes for you to recover from it. If it's 500 yeah. pounds, it could take five days. And I, I was telling that to my a buddy of mine who's a strength coach. And he said, you know, I mean, it, it definitely seems overly simple, but it's a great rule of thumb that, that maybe just can, uh, yeah, that, that can, can actually provide a lot of clarity for something that people don't usually see. Do you, do you find that? Yeah, that holds I think up? so. Yeah. I, I first kind of, kind of locked into this idea, of, uh, after listening to Dr. Mike Israel of Renaissance periodization, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he's got a point. And you don't even have to read research papers to, to kind of be convinced of this. If you look at very, you know, the whole idea of doing a bro split where like, you know, uh, Monday is chest and back and you train chest and back only once a week. Well, if you are 280 pounds and 6% body fat and you can bench 500 pounds, you know, you can only train back and chest once a week because it'll take you six days to recover. Right. Uh, but, you know, if you're not nearly as big and strong, you recover much faster. So. You know, if I've got a woman who weighs 115 pounds and she's a beginner, you can train whole body almost every single day for a while. Okay, and 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 to be clear, I mean, in the in the context of the article, training heavy doesn't necessarily mean heavy singles or okay, I can bench press this much. You you talk about just making occasional forays into the three to five range for four to five sure, week cycles, sure. Which is uh, which is yeah. sounds different than than what you used to train, right? And you never you were you were the uh, never more than five guy. Yeah, but that was mostly just like an ego problem on my end. I mean, uh-huh. Well, that's a, <laughs> I that's like, part of this, though, right? <laughs> yeah, sure it is. And by the way, ego is just fine as long as it has its proper place. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of my points is that you know, uh, there. And I think I mentioned this in my in my column. Um, you know, there is this well known saying that you don't do what you like, do what you need. Mm-hmm. And I sort of take umbrage with that. I think you should do both because doing what you like is what kind of keeps you going. It's what kind of keeps you in the game. So, you know, doing what you like is important because that keeps you engaged. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, you also have to do what you need. And so for me, doing what I like is heavy singles on squats and deadlifts. And doing what I need is kind of working on work capacity a little bit more, maybe a little bit of mobility work, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a mix. Mm-hmm. So, so if somebody's looking to set up their ideal little uh, full body workout, do you do okay? I do what I need first, and then I do what I want for the last fifteen minutes, or and save that save that time. Yeah, yeah, I like that approach. And by the way, one way you can implement that is you can let's say you tend to gravitate toward maxes, and uh, you don't like doing reps. Go up to a max first. Let's say you're bench pressing. Work up to a heavy single or heavy triple, whatever it is you're doing, and then reduce the weight a little bit and start putting some work in. Mm-hmm. And then you know you kind of get the best of both worlds, mm-hmm. and that sounds like a good way to to d- get a lot of work done in an a, in a workout that might still take somewhere around an hour too, which is another concern, right? Once you get once you get the the lifting bug, it can be really easy to start going in there and it just oh uh, it's a, an hour and fifteen, an hour and thirty. Um, how how do you how do you enforce in- efficiency in your training? Yeah, well, one and and you know by the way, the stronger you get the longer your workouts end up being. Right. And that's where people gravitate toward doing more sessions per week because then this, it's a way to shorten your sessions. But one way that it's amazing more people don't do more of this, but one, one way to just really improve your efficiency is to, um, to uh, do your exercises in a circuit mm-hmm. or at least in pairing. So if you're doing four exercises, you can do a four exercise circuit or you can go back and forth between exercise one and two until they're finished and then go the same with three and four. And that just really is a way to kind of uh, dissipate fatigue and kind of uh, take shorter rest between exercises. And if you're not doing that currently and you've never done it, just making that one change will take 25% off the length of your workouts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's a, it yeah. feels different at the end too. Yeah, definitely. I yeah, remember, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. I remember trying escalating density training a couple of years ago when I was training uh, for the yeah. RKC the first time, 
and, which is which is a system that you originated, and it felt totally different. Just taking pairings, taking three movements, and just working on you know gradually bringing things, doing more work. It was a it was a really interesting experience. Do you do you find that that uh, that that style, which you can you can explain a little bit more about what that means, uh, works well for the aging age the ageless lifter, as I guess we would call that person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think it does. It's it's certainly easier on the joints. Um, you know, without any question. And uh, there's a cardiovascular benefit and maybe more of an endorphin rush from that kind of uh, training, at least for some people. Uh, and, you know, again, it's more efficient. You know, if you're doing higher repetitions and shorter rest breaks, uh, you don't, your warm-ups are fewer and your rest between sets are shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, another way to even further compound the efficiency of that is to do slow eccentrics. So, in other words, uh, you lift the weight in an accelerative manner, mm -hmm. but you lower the weight, maybe four to five seconds per rep, and that further reduces the amount of weight you use, which maybe, you know, you can't brag about how much weight you're using on Facebook, but it allows you to get more result with less weight, and that basically filters down to shorter workouts, so that's a that's a great tool. Right. Make, making light weights heavy, is that is that a good goal? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it's a great goal, especially when you are trying to improve body composition, for mm -hmm. sure. There's just no question. So a, a lot of times, um, going back to the example before where you have your fun and then you do your work, I might work up to a heavy single, and then I will back down to 80% of that and maybe knock out sets of five. But I have no concern about the weight on the bar because I've already done that. I've already done my single. So now I just work. I make mm -hmm. that muscle suffer. And I, I, you know, execute full range of motion and slow eccentric tempos, make everything super clean. And uh, that's a nice, nice way to train. Okay. I like that. Hmm. Now, now, talking just a, a sl the slightest bit about, about nutrition, you had great success with the flexible dieting approach. Yeah. Um, but, it, but if somebody kind of balks at the idea of measuring things and counting macros, um, what, 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 what can they do if they look at that and they say, yeah, it's great, but I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get out the scale. I don't want to count my macros. Yeah. 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 And, and by the way, although I have most of my clients, most of my clients do use flexible dieting, but Hey, if you can, you can get from point A to point B without, you know, without tracking, let's do that for mm -hmm. sure. And so then what you have to do is you have to kind of find a proxy for tracking. And so one of those proxies is, you know, f focusing on food composition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we're talking fruits and vegetables and lean proteins. And uh, if your meals are composed mostly of those foods, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. You can gain body fat if you eat too much of it. But, of course, it's just very hard to eat too much of those kind of foods. So that's that's like one of the – that's one of the, the, the tricks. And that's, you know, if you look at competitive bodybuilders back – all the way back to the 60s, that's mm -hmm. kind of how they ate, you know. And – those foods also are helpful because they don't stimulate cravings. Right. Uh, so flexible dieting can be problematic. If you are the kind of person where you eat one cookie and then 10 minutes later the box of cookies is gone, uh, flexible dieting may not work for you. Mm -hmm. And we're all different. So I think one of the things that's really useful to do is determine your personality type when it comes to cravings. Um, and I be can a eat a cookie. Be realistic about it. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's not right or wrong. Like, there's no morality in this. Like, people are just wired differently. So, I mean, I can eat a cookie and call it a day and move on to the next thing. Not everybody can do that. So, uh, so that's the first step, I think, in in kind of learning to know yourself. Okay. Yeah. Just really, really taking stock of this. It sounds like in taking this project seriously. It's not just. Uh, it, it, it is sort of the project of your life almost. Yeah, and you know, understanding human behavior is huge. So from a biochemical point of view, you could lose body fat eating nothing but cookies and ice cream and donuts. You could totally do it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, you know, uh, there's two problems. One is long term, you know, you're not getting the micronutrients you need for good health long term. But just functionally, um, you know, uh, those types of foods do not satiate you. They don't make you full. So it's just difficult to to be in a caloric deficit when you have low nutrition, low bulk, high calorie kind of foods. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's doable biochemically, but often not behaviorally. Well, great. Hey, I really appreciate all the, all the perspective you've been giving us here. Um, we, uh, we have, we have one article that's about, I think it's going to come out either today or in the next couple of days. And then, um, this is going to be a, a regular occurrence. He's, uh, Charles Staley has been 
a regular occurrence on bodybuilding.com for a few years now. I think you were before in the old days as well, right? And yeah, I was way back in the day, and then I had a little hiatus, and mm -hmm. now we're back. Yeah, so so if you go to his author page on bodybuilding.com, you will find uh, many, many different topics that he's t covered over the years, and then working on a book now as well. Yeah, that should be out in, in the spring of uh, 2018. Okay. And we've got a couple of different working titles for that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, the, the, the working title we're going with right now is Confessions of an Unlikely Fitness Pro. <laughs> so <laughs> and the emphasis is on transparency and honesty. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, my personal story is that even though I'm a very visible, uh, you know, and well-known fitness authority, um, I did not really have all aspects of my fitness in check until my 50s. And so guess what? Even if you're an expert, you're a real person, and we all, we all struggle with certain things. And so, uh, you know, in this, this age of uh, Instagram in particular, there's, there's not a lot of transparency, and there's all sorts of people like using fake weights. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, – it's not the most honest medium in some ways. So um, it was my feeling that um, what is really missing in the marketplace is an honest um, discussion – of fitness from somebody who's like an industry insider. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to do. With I like this. it. Yeah. That, that, that title brings to mind an old book called muscle by Paul Fussell. Have you ever read that book? It was a, it's, it, it's called confessions of an unlikely bodybuilder. It was from the late eighties, early nineties. Oh, interesting. You know, yeah. now that you say that it kind of vaguely rings a bell. Yeah. So I hope I'm not going to be repping off oh, this no, title. No, but... not, not, not at all. I think, but I would, I would recommend it highly. It's uh totally to the hilt, insane, um, di deep dive into bodybuilding in New York City in the 80s and 90s, and it's one of my absolute favorite books. Anytime, oh, anybody, starts, anytime anybody starts working here, I, I force them to read it, and their life just is on hold while they're reading it, because once you start it, it just consumes you. So, oh, I got I to read that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and you are easily found on various um, uh, social media as well, Facebook and Instagram, right? Facebook, Instagram, and website is dailystrategies.com, and... Uh, either any any of those three work out just great great all right well thanks for talking with us charles thank you nick appreciate it hey did you know bodybuilding.com actually offers free shipping on most orders over 49 dollars. seriously just look for the be elite badge across the site and on your favorite supplements thousands of top products from the biggest brands are included like optimum gym dimatize cellucor and plenty more if you haven't already, check out bodybuilding.com slash be elite. That's all one word. Kind of looks like be elite for more details.